Good afternoon and hello everyone. Welcome to our Global Perspectives on Race and Racism Speaker Series. My name is Dr. Jaira J. Harrington, Assistant Professor in the Black Studies Department at UIC. I will serve as moderator for today's talk, When Water is Safer Than Land, Warson Shire's Home as a Work of Witness by Professor Brittany Ray Crowell. Here's the rundown of today's schedule. First, I'll provide some background about the series. Second, I will introduce our speaker. She will share her presentation. And last, we will have open Q&A where comments in the chat will be acknowledged and you can also raise your hand just so that you can dialogue a bit with our guests. And then we will close for the afternoon. Before we begin, I would like to offer some background about the series. With support from the programming committees in the departments of Latin American and Latino studies, sociology, global Asian studies, and gender and women's studies, the Department of Black Studies is hosting the Global Perspectives on Race and Racism speaker series for fall 2023. This interdisciplinary series features scholars with expertise across the world to address the global, socio-historical, economic, and systemic effects of racism. These events provide multiple perspectives through which participants can explore the global dynamics of racism. And we will see the phenomena of race not only intersect with citizenship, belonging, and constructs of the nation state, they also commingle with class, gender, sexuality, and ability. This series will highlight race and racism from a variety of disciplinary perspectives and geographic contexts. Now for today, I will introduce our speaker, Dr. Brittany Ray Crowell, who is an assistant professor of English at Clark Atlanta University. She earned her doctorate in literary, literature and creative writing with a focus in poetry at the University of Houston. A recipient of a Donald Barthelm Prize in Poetry and the Lucy Terry Prince Prize, her poems have appeared in Copper Nickel, Plowshares, and elsewhere. Her work as a librettist has been featured at Ohio State University and at the Kennedy Center's Cartography Project with the project Black Dignity in the nation's capital, Washington, DC. Her current research focuses on polyvocality, personal archives, and intuitive witness in the work of Black women poets. The floor is yours, Professor Ray Crowell. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. And thank you all for having me here. Thank you to the participants for, for coming. Um, so I'll share my screen here and we'll get right into it. Um, this is an interactive presentation, so please feel free to ask questions in the chat and uh, answer the questions. So let me just get this set up here. Okay. And I'll begin. All right, so I'll be presenting on Warson Shire's home as a work of witness. And so I, I want to start with the question of what comes to mind when you hear the term poetry of witness? Um, and you can answer out. Um, I think you can raise your hand and we can call on you. You can answer in the chat. What comes to mind? What associations do you have? Any takers? Well, that's okay. We'll warm up. Okay, Naomi. Um, poetry that's derived after witnessing something? Absolutely. Anyone else? That's all right. We'll get we'll get warmed up. We'll get familiar with each other and 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 we'll maybe be more comfortable. Uh, but that was great, um, Naomi. Um, a great response. Um, a form of testimony, great, a form of resistance. Excellent. So these are all totally on point. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background, um, 
the term poetry of witness was coined by Carolyn Forche in her 1999 anthology Against Forgetting 20th Century Poetry of Witness. And uh, the poet the poet defines the genre of work, poetry of witness, as work that exists within the social, which is a space that intersects um, between the personal and the political. So the intimate experience that we have um, when we enter sort of the political uh, or the political sphere. Um, what is that for us personally? And so, um, like some of you mentioned, poetry of witness, if we get down to the crux of what we mean by witness is to provide a testimony, to be present during the course of an event, to offer evidence or to provide an account of something. And so in the case of this poem in particular, um, which is spoken from the perspective of uh, a refugee speaker um, and all those facing various forms of political persecution, bearing witness on their own behalf is an act of resistance, which you all um, astutely uh, noted. Okay, and for a second, I'm going to we had a little bit of trouble earlier as far as uh, being able to share the screen directly from the, the slide. So what we're going to do is we're going to listen to the poet actually uh, recite her poem because I always like to hear it in their voice. Um, it does have some graphics with it um, and I will um, enable closed captioning. But as we're listening to it, think about first, what are your first expectations of the title home and then how your expectations may be changed after you hear. Okay. So I'm gonna pull up. Okay. Is everyone able to see the YouTube screen? Yes. Great, thank you. Home. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbors running faster than you, breath bloody in their throats. And the boy you went to school with who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factories holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one leaves home unless home chases you, fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. And even then, you carry the anthem under your breath, only tearing up your passport in airport toilets, sobbing as each mouthful of paper made it clear that you would not be going back. You have to understand, and no one would put their children in a boat unless the sea is safer than the land. No one burns their palms under trains, beneath carriages. No one spends days and nights in the gallbladder of a truck feeding on newspaper unless the miles traveled mean something more than journey. No one crawls under fences, wants to be beaten, wants to be pitied. No one chooses refugee camps or strip searches where your body is left aching or prison because prison is safer than a city of fire and one prison guard in the night is safer than 14 men who look like your father. No one could take it, could stomach it. No one skin would be tough enough. The go home blacks, refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers, sucking our country dry, niggers with their hands out. They smell strange, savage, messed up their own country and now they wanna mess up ours? How do the words, dirty looks, roll off your back? And maybe it's because the blow is softer than a limb torn off. Or the words are more tender than 14 men between your legs. Or the insults are easier to swallow than rubble, than bone, than your child's body in pieces. I wanna go home. But home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of a gun. And no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore. Unless home told you to quicken your legs. Leave your clothes behind. Crawl through the desert. Wade through the oceans. Drown, save, be hungry, beg, forget pride. Your survival is more important. No one leaves home unless home is a sweaty voice in your ear saying, leave, run away from me now. 
I don't know what I've become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here. So, and if you would like to follow along, oh, great. Yes, the poem is in the chat. Um, so if you want to take just a minute to be able to sort of like process the poem for yourself, um, Dr. Harrington, they've already seen the poem, um, but to just take a moment to kind of sit with some of the lines. I'll go ahead and share my screen again. So some of the expectations that we have when it comes to this particular poem, as I said before, are um, are not fulfilled as we begin to read the poem. And so there are certain aspects that I want to focus on today because we could be here all day talking about this wonderfully uh, poignant poem. Um, but the purpose of Poetry of Witness is not to transform readers into witnesses necessarily, because there's no way that we can be actual witnesses just from um, what we read, not in the same way as the speaker or someone that has experienced it as the poet that writes about it. Um, but the purpose is to transform us into an audience for the speaker's deposition in which the strategic violence and silences and omissions that have been um, committed by uh, uh, the state or, or the particular governments are uncovered by the poet. Um, so we're here to stand as an audience for the speaker to bear witness of their experience, um, to provide some agency for them as they are able to recall this trauma as it actually happened. And so what we'll focus on today is the title, uh, the opening line, um, how metaphor and simile and imagery and personification and polyvocality are working as tools of witness um, that Shire is using to craft this particular experience of witness for us. So again, um, and I asked before, what were your expectations before reading the poem? Uh, when you read uh, just the title home, what kind of emotions does the word home evoke for you? Comfort, absolutely. Memory warmth. These are excellent responses. Secure, safe, absolutely. Safety. Sure. Familiar, great. And you can keep them going. Family, absolutely, in the chat. And again, if you, if you want to speak out, you most certainly can. You can raise your hand. Love, union, family, absolutely. So for many readers, because we all don't necessarily have the same background, we all don't have the same type of home, um, but for, for many readers, the title immediately evokes exactly the things that you all brought up of unconditional comfort, safety, and warmth. So therefore, before the poem even begins, Shire is lulling us into this false sense of security, which is soon to be breached, which is um, very reminiscent to the experience that she is going to unfold for us, um, where the speaker feels as if they are safe. And that is kind of snatched from under them, this notion of home. And so thinking about the opening line, uh, the opening line uh, is very important, just like in any you know, uh, type of uh, art. Uh, whatever comes first is supposed to hook you. Um, and with poetry, 
you really have to grab the reader's attention very soon or you don't really get the investment uh, for them to continue reading on. Um, same thing with the first page of a book. Um, and some of the ways that they do this in poetry is to create some type of tension. Um, and so with this line, no one leaves home unless, uh, what specific word kind of creates the tension for us that makes us want to read on more? Absolutely, unless, because it sounds unfinished. And so we have this, what we call enjambment, where the line leads to the next line uh, for us to understand, unless what, right? Excellent job. And so, unless is a conjunction um, in the actual, Dictionary definition is except if. So used to introduce the case in which a statement being made is not true or valid or that you're going to contradict whatever it was that you said. And so she's introducing the scenarios, scenes, conditions, and contexts the speaker knows to be true, which counter other narratives crafted against their own testimony. So unless is a signal for us um, that there is an exception which betrays these expectations for stability that were alluded to in the title. From all the positive definitions we gave of home, unless makes it worrying. Very good. And you're tapping into um, the, the tension that it's building for us. Already, we feel some type of anxiety, especially because we've had all these nice and sort of warm, fuzzy associations with home. And when that's threatened, that already begins the type of anxiety. And again, we aren't necessarily going to be the same type of witnesses, but it is creating or it's trying to the best that we can do in a poem, creating that same type of fear and anxiety through the experience of the poem. So these are great. Great observations. Okay. And so throughout the poem, there are several instances of metaphor and simile, but some specific ones that we're going to talk about today. So where do you all notice where the author uses metaphor versus using simile? And what are some of the respective effects of each of this dev these devices? Um, so is there a particular metaphor that you see? And again, and I know you probably already know the definitions to these, but just in case um, I put them, a simile is a comparison that uses like or as, and sometimes than. Um, and a metaphor does not use like or as. So is anyone able to point out a particular metaphor? And if you need a little hint, it's repeated. If not, that's okay. Absolutely. Home is the mouth of a shark. So would that be our metaphor or our simile? Metaphor, absolutely. Because it doesn't use like or and, as. Excellent. So when you get to this particular metaphor and thinking about what are the effects, what is she trying to do? What is the intention of this particular device in creating this experience for us? Home is the mouth of a shark. Metaphor allows for home to fully transform into the symbol of fear and imminent danger. So it's not like a shark. It is a shark. And so it, it's a a more intense and more powerful effect to use a metaphor in, in this instance, because it's not liking likening it to anything. It's not adjacent to it, it is. It becomes the embodiment of the thing that you're comparing it to. Um, whereas 
some of the similes that are involved. Water is safer than land, a gun bigger than his body. Um, and this isn't less effective, but they're just doing different things. Here, water in water is safer than land. It forces us to try to contemplate and conceptualize placing one's faith in something fluid, literally and figuratively, thinking about the water and the nature of it. Um, that's something that's unstable over once, what was once represented tangible and stable. In, in stable. Um, and then a gun bigger than his body, it activates our perception because instantly, if you make that comparison, I'm looking in my mind's eye and I'm thinking of a boy and I'm thinking of how tall would a gun have to be to be taller than a boy? And what is the boy doing with this gun? Um, so really being able to uh, key into what our mind does when we have comparisons that it instantly projects an image for us. And it also uh, forces us to sort of grapple with these negotiations of the images and what they mean to us um, to see a boy with a gun just as big as he is, right? Okay. So now thinking of the imagery that is involved, um, you have different types of imagery. You have concrete imagery, uh, perceptual imagery, and conceptual imagery. So concrete imagery is the type of imagery that is vivid and clear, right? So if I say I peeled my orange that was so bright against the gray of December, that is very clear. I can see that, right? Whereas perceptual imagery is kind of figurative, it's metaphorical. Um, so if I say the tower of my wife's wrist, I can see that I understand that a tower is long. So I'm comparing my wife's wrist to something that's long. I must be saying that her wrist is long. Um, and whereas conceptual imagery is like the most figurative and it requires more of like this visceral or intuitive understanding. So if I say something like, um, and these are all... Uh, from other poems. Um, but if I say something like, I am a bowl of howl, I have to sit with that for a second and think about what that might mean. And I might not get a clear meaning, but it's something that I can feel and I can sort of uh, intuit what that means. It requires that type of work. And before we move on to personification, thinking of imagery, what type of images are involved or that you see in this particular poem. Are they more concrete, perceptual? So even if we take the metaphor, thinking of uh, the mouth of a shark, absolutely concrete. We can see that, right? It made me think of, you know, Jaws or something. Maybe not Jaws because that can be a little, you know, cartoonish, but definitely I could see that, okay? Um, someone else said perceptual. And I think that there are some, could you give an example maybe of one that you might think is more perceptual? I think that that, that could work. There are some. Yeah, I think so, because that is something that I'd have to um, kind of do a little bit of work in my mind's eye to have to create that image, right? No, it's okay, it's okay. Um, why do you think that she uses more concrete imagery rather than perceptual or conceptual? What would be the purpose of that? Because everything in poetry is intentional to describe the experiences in detail, absolutely. So you can see what she might have experienced firsthand, absolutely. 
It makes the details more intense. Yes, it makes it more literal for us. Because if you're recounting particular atrocities and you want to make the reader know that this is real, so it can't be misinterpreted, absolutely. Uh, she wants, if we're thinking of uh, creating a narrative that's going to be put into the archive or that's working against what's already been developed in the archive, uh, or, or you want to be able to make it clear, to make it certain what is happening. You don't want it to be metaphorical for people to say, oh, well, you know, they were speaking figuratively. You want it to be as clear and concrete as possible. As people who haven't experienced what she has, she has to use examples that anyone can imagine. Absolutely. Okay? So that's why she uses uh, the metaphors that she uses, or that's why she uses particular words that are going to be very, very clear. The language even um, complements the imagery and the fact that it's not a uh, super complicated diction because she wants it to be as clear as possible, okay? And lastly, thinking about personification and polyvocality. Um, in this poem, there are several times where there is something that is non-human that exhibits human characteristics. And in terms of polyvocality, that's the presence of multiple voices within a work. So are you able to, if you were to look at the poem, um, are there certain areas where you see maybe the speaker speaking? And then are there other areas that you see another speaker? How many voices do you think are in this poem? We know one for sure. Okay, at least two. Sure. Two. Okay. So really, if you're able to look along, if you look in stanzas one through six and eight, that is the main speaker. Okay. So the person that we first sort of hear that ushers in this experience for us, right? But when you get to stanza seven, and that's the one that starts with the go home blacks, refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers, this, it's still the speaker who's initiating this, but this takes on a different voice, okay? This takes on the voice of those who are speaking out against these particular refugees and using the exact language, the oppressor, absolutely. Um, people that have co-signed on um, these atrocities. Um, and she does this because she wants to evoke the harm in the language even. Um, because as we go through um, all the way to the end of this particular stanza, and it ends with maybe because the blow is softer than a limb torn off. So as we're reading this, we have a reaction to it. It's difficult to hear these things that are being said and to know that these are things that are actually being said, but it sets up uh, this, the last two lines of the stanza, maybe because the blow is softer, is allowing us to see that even this experience is softer than the actual physical aspects that happen of a limb being torn off. Uh, the next stanza, or the words are more tender than 14 men between your legs. So saying that the names that they're being called is nothing compared to how it snowballs into the physical violence. And then lastly, stanza nine. Whose voice is stanza nine? No one leaves home exactly until home is a sweaty voice in your ear saying, leave, run away from me now. I don't know what I've become. 
but I know that anywhere is safer than here. Why does she end that way? Why does she end with home? And in this particular moment, what home is saying? Right. Home wants to be welcoming, but knows that it cannot be. And I, I think that that's, that's great the way that you, you word that. It brings it full circle by explaining why they add it, unless in the first answer, absolutely. And I think also to have this personification of home, where home is able to speak and to say, I don't know what I've become. Um, taking the blame away from the community and home and more attention. Yes, um, to say that home didn't choose to take this turn. Um, home was forced, it was destroyed um, to where home can't even recognize itself anymore. And also just the poignancy of telling, home telling you who it has embraced in, you know, well, uh, held you and and does for you what home does provides the warmth for it to tell you to run away from it is also just so heartbreaking um and so to leave on that note the tension that was started in the first it ends with this same intensity um uh and it almost feels not unfinished but it feels unresolved too. Um, so excellent, excellent responses. And so to end my presentation, I wanted to uh, conjure up um, Audrey Lord. Um, in her essay, uh, Poetry is Not a Luxury, she says, for women, poetry is not a luxury. It is a vital necessity of our existence. It forms the quality of the light within which we predicate our hopes and dreams towards survival and change. So in this way, we see that with Warsan Shire and other poets of witness, that this is not, you know, sort of the, the luxury of poetry that we think, you know, that you sit in your, you know, in your comfy, you know, library and you're writing these love poems and everything is, is fine. Um, but that it's it's vital um, for existence. It's vital for the narratives to be able to be um, redressed um, and for the truth to be revealed. Um, so uh, I thank you and I appreciate you having me. Um, and I are we opening for questions. Yes, we are. Um, thank you so much, Professor Ray Kroll. Um, I would like to invite our students to um, ask you some questions, um, perhaps give, give a little bit of feedback. And um, so raise your hand, drop uh, comments, and we can engage our speaker. Some of the comments, of course, they're very loving and providing you a little bit of home while you're visiting us virtually. Um, this was such a great presentation. Thank you for this. Um, I love this. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that poem. It was very powerful and very relevant. Um, and someone asked, do you have any favorite books regarding Black history? Yes, I do. Um, I, if we're talking about poetry books, um, and if we're talking about poetry of witness, um, or poetry that seeks to kind of reveal um, other historical atrocities of Black people committed against Black people, Eve Ewing's 1919 is amazing. Um, I think that uh, uh, one of my favorite, favorite books is um, Magnolia 
by A. Van Jordan, which tells the story of um, uh, Magnolia Cox, uh, who was the first Black uh, person to go to the National Spelling Bee and how she was given a word that allegedly wasn't on the list and how that affected her. Um, those are just two offhand um, uh, that I that I could think of in terms of poetry. Uh, Ariana Benson's Black Pastoral, uh, Vivi Francis, uh, Forest Primeval. Those are some first. Uh, but if you're looking for just historical poetry, definitely 1919, because it's talking about um, the race riots that happened in Chicago. Um, and it, it gives uh, excerpts, actually, from um, different newspapers during that time. Thank you so, so much. Um, another question, how did you get into poetry? Personally, I've always wanted to do it as a hobby. So give wow. us a little bit about your backstory and your connection to poetry. Oh gosh. Um, you know, I, it's gonna sound really cliche, but like I started writing really, really early. I lived, well, I, I would stay with my grandparents who were uh, educators and they had so many books and they had one anthology and I just, I wore it out. Um, and I just always wanted to be like those writers. Um, I would just memorize poems at my grandparents' house until my parents could pick me up. Um, and so, yeah, just being able to, you know, also, you know, put my little experience down. I wrote my first poem at about seven years old um, in a little notebook that had ladybugs on the cover. Um, and it just went from there. So thank you for asking. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, so what he says, I've always had appreciation for poetry, specifically this kind of poetry, but this presentation provided so much context. And we do appreciate the help in reading through this this poem with you. Um, Marissa asks, what are some of your favorite poems? Oh, wow. Um, again, I love Evie Ewing. She's amazing. She's um, generous. Uh, and she has a poem called I Saw Emmett Till. Um, of course, I'm going to put your, my favorite poem title, but I saw Emmett Till yesterday in the grocery store. Um, and it's just so it the way that she sort of unfolds this world um, where Emmett Till is alive and gets to grow old and is able to exist in this poem, which is what I think is uh, when we're thinking of uh, what Black poets can do, what poets can do um, is to be able to use our work as these sites for, as she calls, time machines or what if machines. Um, and so allowing this poem to kind of be not just a resting place, but like an, an alternate dimension where he is able to escape harm. It's just beautiful. So, um, and then if you're gonna take it, you know, super old school, one of the first poems, and I kid you not, I memorized The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. That was like my jam. Um, so, you know, I those are just two, if you were looking at two sides of the spectrum. Okay, Des, thank you for this question. How do your own poetic practices and processes relate to your analysis of Black poetry and maybe even speak about the process of analysis that you went through in helping us think through um, home? Well, this is a great question. Um, well, one of the things that I do, I'm really into craft. So when I annotate, I really want to see how does this poem work? I really create like a map of it. Um, when I annotate, as a matter of fact, I don't know if you can see this, but, you know, I write all over the page because I want to see, you know, what tools are they using to create these experiences? Um, and so I really go through and I, I, I create a map. Um, and, uh, 
I'll read it over and over again. And then, especially poems that I really like, I'll say like, what would it look like for me to use this in my own voice or for my own intentions? Um, and so I hope that answers your question. Um, I really spend a lot of time breaking it down and annotating and speaking to people about it too, to see their ideas. Um, and also I like to read a lot of work that challenges me, especially in terms of form, because I'm very um, curious about uh, different possibilities that we have when we step outside of uh, typical forms um, and, and, and really push the boundaries of what we can um, have the readers to experience. Um, on the page um, by by way of what we use to manipulate um, these different contexts of meaning. Fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, another question here. How do you bring your own poems to life? Like making them come to life and be memorable. So what is your process with that? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I am very image-based. Um, I like to use a lot of different images. Um, I think about uh, the emotions that I want to evoke um, for readers, and I try to tap into, you know, just common experiences. Um, and I, I, I really appreciate nuance and novelty. So when I'm writing, I'm thinking like, how can I say something that everyone will understand, but in a way they've never heard before? So what comparisons will be able to do that? Um, again, I really like playing with form and making up new forms too. Um, so like uh, in the collection that I have now, my manuscript, I have some playlist poems. Um, I have poems that sort of combine erasure. Um, I also like to work with um, source texts. So um, how can I use things like my grandmother's journals and integrate them with my own work? Thank you. A playlist poem sounds super dope. Indeed, that does. <laughs> um, any yeah. other questions for our speaker? One thing I would like to, I'm, I'm a little bit curious about, and I think the students would also um, find interesting, is to speak about the connection between your interest in poetry and how it works with your work as an educator. Um, so you have been an educator in multiple settings. Um, so if you could speak to poetry, um, the kind of pedagogy that you have around it, um, the kind of creativity that you inspire in students, we'd like to hear a little more about that. Sure. Well, um, I have taught uh, pretty much everything from, you know, middle school students, high school students. Um, and the one thing that sort of informs, you know, my teaching of just poetry is literature or um, writing poetry, because I um, also do poetry workshops, is to basically let my students understand that, like, your process needs to be led, whether it's reading a poem or writing a poem, by experimentation in, in play, um, and even in your interpretation. So to take away some of the fear from it, you know, when you're looking at a poem, you can't go into it thinking that there's always a right answer, but think about the possibilities um, for meaning that exist. And um, allowing yourself, if you are writing a poem, to be able to just experiment and play. Um, and especially in terms of revision, um, you may have a draft and then come back and think about, well, what would happen if I did this? What would happen if I allowed this, this to take on a different form? Um, and also, you know, if we're just reading poems to be like, you know, what if, uh, what would happen if this writer wrote another poem from a different perspective. So always allowing them to 
not feel as though like I'm, you know, the end all be all with the interpretations, but to be able to really run wild with the possibilities for what poetry can do, their own poetry and the poetry that they're inhabiting. Um, and also just, I'm always really inspired by the activities that we do in class and what my students um, write. Um, because I think that, and also reading lots of different types of poets, because you can't become a better writer without reading a lot of different poetry. Um, it just helps to spark something in you. So I know that was kind of all over the place, but um, just inspiring them to feel comfortable with being uncomfortable, with not always knowing what something means and allowing that to push them to um, embrace different possibilities. Another question from our audience. Thank you for that response. After being an educator for a wide range of ages, what is one piece of literature that can be understood by most, if not all the ones within this widespread? So um, point to some, some literature or um, a poem that you found to be widely accessible. Oh, wow. There's so many, there's so many, but the one in particular that I think is just off the top of my head. There's a poem by Edgar Allan Poe called um, Two, and then just like a line. It's very short. Um, and I found that it's super accessible to all audiences because it's very short, but also just sort of the pathos behind it. Um, really, really, it, it's basically a poem where he's saying, um, you know, it starts off, I heed not that my earthly lot. And it's basically him writing towards someone and the name is redacted. You don't know who it is, but he's basically saying like, I don't care that I don't have a lot. I don't care that the saddest people are not, are, are happier than I am. Um, but I, I'm sad that this particular person that they're talking about, I guess a lover, sorrows for their fate and just thinks that they're kind of, you know, just going to pass by. And I've been able to, it's such a short poem, but it's so interesting, the different things that different people pull out. Um, younger uh, students um, liken it to, you know, uh, different social media posts of when you're, you know, calling out to somebody, but you don't say their name. And, and they brought up, you know, what would that look like in today's age? Um, and just also just the sentiment of just like uh, that type of melancholy that would come from writing something like that. Um, as well as, um, oh goodness, I can't think of the name of the poem right now. Harriet Mullins, uh, Dim Lady, which is, um, basically a poem that takes one of Shakespeare's sonnets and creates it in kind of modern day language. It's also, it's, it's almost like a translation, a modern translation. So um, uh, that's the particular sonnet is the one that your eyes are nothing like the sun. Um, and she's able to sort of uh, almost translate word for word um, uh, in more modern language. And I found that audiences like being able to do that exercise themselves too, um, to take a poem and uh, maybe make a synonym for each word um, so that it becomes something, something different. Fascinating. Any more questions? Ah, do you have a favorite Shakespeare play? Oh, you know what? I like Julius Caesar. Um, I always really love teaching that. Um, and this is gonna like tell my age, but there's a part where like um he's basically saying, like, you know, I'm not gonna like run away from whatever the situation was. And I remember when I first started teaching, Lil Wayne had a song out. And it was like, I, I'm not going to pick the day to start running. 
And I just always think of that when I read it. Um, so that's why. I also like to integrate music into the curriculum. Um, I, I'll be teaching a course on hip hop as secular scripture next semester. So I like to play with different genres with poetry and literature too. Could you say a little bit more about that? Uh, about music and yes, music, poetry, the kind of hybridities that you explore. Um, you mentioned how it is that when you teach poetry uh, and also you teach writing poetry, that there's a bit of play and um, that you have. And so it sounds like you are um, open to exploration, a bit of playfulness when it comes to uh, an appreciation for poetry and nurturing a growing appreciation that your students may have. So if you could speak to a little bit more uh, about that. Sure. Um, I think that, you know, music is something that's just so universal. Like you may have people that don't like poetry and you may have people that don't like literature. Pretty much everybody has some type of music that they like. And music is so great for setting like tone and what we call like maybe like aura too. Like if I hear a song or if I see a reference to a song in a book or somewhere else, I instantly am taken back to a particular time or a particular like mood from that time. And so being able to fuse the two, I feel like makes for uh, an easier transition sometimes into harder genres, you know, like I've had people to say, you know, um, I didn't like poetry, but once I saw, you know, how it, can evoke, you know, the same feelings or emotions as music, then, you know, I was on board. Or, you know, just finding examples of poems that make references to songs, because it's almost like a little Easter egg. If I'm reading a poem, or if a student writes a poem and, and puts in a song that I don't know, I have to go. I, I can't help it. It's like a word that I don't know in a text. I have to go and look it up so that I'm in on like the joke. Um, so that's kind of what I think of. And, and in terms of just thinking of how music does become like our own poetry, um, I won't say that lyrics can always be considered as poetry, but they become so precious to us that we're able to recite them like we recite poems or like we recite scripture. So that's kind of the, the different work that I'm interested in and being able to fuse those two genres. Awesome. A question here, uh, or a kind of comment requiring a response. Sam wants to know, is there any hip hop artists from your teaching that you can recommend? Oh, goodness. I, one of my favorite rappers is Big Grit out of Mississippi. Um, he's just amazing. Um, I like Zaire Rashad. Um, in terms of, uh, there's a Houston artist named Maxo Cream, really like him. Um, he has this one particular song called Roaches that's just great storytelling. Um, so those are a few that off the top of my head uh, that, I, that I'm thinking about. And I'm also trying to like super appropriate, um, but I, I those are the two that I, or the two or three that I, I thought of off the top of my head. Um, I'm, I'm interested in, in where hip hop is going and where rap is going. Um, so I don't, I don't cancel anything out. I, I really could use anybody. Um, but those, those are just some that I know that I've used before. Um, I know that, I, and I'm from Texas. Uh, Charlie Boy is an old school a uh, rapper, but when we talk about hip hop as um, secular scripture, hip hop as religion, I really like to talk about his cadence. Now he sounds like a deacon, um, you know, uh, singing an old 100. So yeah, those are a few off the top of my head. All right, all right. Um, and just to kind of um, weave back some of the um, 
some of the language that you had earlier in talking about poetry as not a luxury and thinking about that through the lens of Warson Shire and Audre Lorde. Um, one of the words that came up for me when thinking about the poem Home and making these sorts of connections is the idea of survival. Um, and so could you speak a little bit more about the kind of perceptions maybe that folks may have about poetry or like process or it's um, kind of accessibility and this, um, what I think is a very stark positioning that poetry is also about survival, survival of narratives, survival of truth telling, survival of witness. Um, so could you speak a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, and it's a great question. I think that, you know, and this is something as, you know, a, a former public school educator that I try to sort of resist against. I think that we are taught from a young age that poetry is something that is, that belongs to maybe like an elite class for some reason, that it's something that is very difficult and is supposed to be difficult. Um, and that, you know, it's one of those things that either you get or you don't get. You're either a poetry person or you're not. Um, but I like to think of it as, again, just like, you know, music. Um, there's some type of poetry that is for you. And as far as survival is concerned, um, if we're thinking about how certain stories are going to be told um, in redressing the archive um, for certain omissions, um, especially those of that, that are intimate or those that are easily lost, the stories of the people that we would never know about. There's something about poetry that's so, it's succinct, but it's so powerfully condensed that it's such an important mechanism for storytelling. Um, sometimes I, I don't know, I don't want to say more so than any other genre, but, but there's something about how intense it can be being so short um, that I feel like sometimes we're able to, to really be able to embody the experience more intensely sometimes. And so if you're telling a story like, you know, refugees being able to tell their story in, in ways that are most concrete that can hit us the hardest. Um, it's essential to be able to have this and to be able to use these tools to create um, these dimensions that we can return to and that we can say this actually happened. Here's the record of it to create a ledger um, for things that would otherwise, you know, be written over or, uh, are totally tossed out, um, especially for populations that, or or people that we normally may, wouldn't wouldn't perhaps hear about. Fabulous! Um, thank you so much. Um, oh, speaking of survival resistance, uh, do you have any survival resistance poems or authors or books to recommend? Thinking along the lines of this theme. Well, these are great questions, and I am trying to. I know Tarfia Fazula's Seam is another great collection. Um, oh, survival and resistance, and now I I, I want to turn around and look at my bookshelf. Um, that's what comes to mind first. Um, the anthology that um. I spoke of uh, the Carolyn Forche anthology, maybe another. Um, those are just some that I'm thinking of off the top of my head. Um, I'm sorry, I'd have to think a little bit more. I know that I know uh, more, but I guess being put on the spot, of course, my mind goes blank. All right, we can we can return to that. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other questions or comments or, oh, oh, thank you, Naomi. All right. Uh, what are your thoughts about the censoring of literature in public schools? <laughs> I, I imagine I mean, you have some things to say about that, Professor Rachel. I have a lot, a lot to say. Um, you know, 
Censorship is another tool to silence and um, uh, it's another tool uh, of control. Um, and I feel as though, you know, we don't give enough credit for what students are able to process and we don't give enough credit to teachers to be able to use their good judgment that they've gone to school many years for and continue to go to school um, to be able to present to students. We're not saying that you throw anything at these children, but it's about the way and the intention behind it. A good example of this was when I was teaching middle school um, in Houston, I taught the poem that um, I brought up earlier, the Eve Ewing poem. Um, uh, I saw Emmett Till this week at the grocery store, which is, you know, very heavy, you know, because they had to have the background of Emmett Till, which they were already reading another book, I think called Ghost Boy, that talked about Emmett Till. They had also seen um, the show, um, Mind Slips Me Now, um, but they had already seen different events. And also, uh, to make a long story short, we did an exercise where these students wrote a poem like um, I saw Emmett Till this weekend at the grocery store where they took a figure from history and put them in another place. Um, I didn't tell them what to write about, but one student decided to write a poem about George Floyd. And the poem was, I saw George Floyd at the park. Um, and it was beautiful the way she created a space for George Floyd to still exist. Um, and I had put the poem on Twitter just, and I'm not a big Twitter person, but it went viral. And, um, one of the critiques, because, you know, on Twitter, it's always a fire. There was a critique was like, why do children have to learn about Emmett Till? They're already seeing so much violence today and they're aware of it. And so poetry and being able to have certain books helps them to contextualize what's going on in their world for themselves. Your job as an educator is to be able to guide and direct that with certain texts. So you don't just give them a book that's about something that's very, uh, you, it has to be age appropriate. Um, and you have to have age appropriate um, practices to be able to do that. Um, but again, it's about trusting students um, and making texts relevant and rigorous um, and trusting educators to be able to do that. Um, because if not, um, once they get out and they go into college, they don't have the foundation that they need to be able to read certain texts. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much. Um, are there any other questions or comments? Appreciate your input. Okay. Thanks for asking. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, it was certainly fascinating and phenomenal. Um, What's fascinating, um, as we kind of wrap up, and if there are any other questions, please chime in. But this presentation is so appropriate as we think about flows and migrations of people throughout the world right now due to violence, um, civil unrest, unstable economies, climate disaster, and other pressing issues that are occurring as we speak. A humanities lens uh, with poetry gives us the room, as you said, to help imagine worlds and also to create a space for these faces that um, and experiences and lives that we may never meet, but creating a space for them to exist. And it also gives us the room to access the emotions and human experience of displacement and migration and others. And um, with the analysis of the poem Home, we're able to develop these kinds of sensibilities and we need these sensibilities now more than ever. So thank you so much for um, this gift and this experience of um, tackling this poem, which has numerous kinds of themes and, and certainly we'll continue the conversation 
um, for for a week or so. Um, but thank you so much for for bringing us uh, this your knowledge, your experience, and your expertise. So thank you very much, Professor Ray Kroll. Thank you. Thank you all for having me, and thank you for your participation. And as we close. Please join us next Tuesday at 3.30 p.m. with guest lecturer, Dr. Anna Laquan Hinton, who will lead us in the talk, Black Feminist Disability Studies Meets Hip Hop Feminism in Janelle Monae's Dirty Computer. And this will be our last talk of the semester next Tuesday. And if there's nothing else here, uh, please thank our guest, um, Professor Brittany Ray Kroll for coming and enjoy a great day. Thank you. Bye, thank you.